Okay, so tonight we have Jane Merza and Kurt Thompson, who have both been in Haiti in the past year. Uh, they've been setting up schools with uh, one laptop or child laptops, with solar arrays, getting power to them, and even deploying the internet in a box, um, and the school server, which is things that they will tell you about, and they have some wonderful photographs as well. Uh, and uh, I'll hand it off to James and Kurt. Hello, everyone. Yeah. It's, not it's working? It's for the camcorder. It's not to amplify your Oh, OK. So you have to talk loud. Just pretend. Just pretend. <laughs> so uh, my name is James, and I'm a student at Loyola Marymount in downtown LA. Um, I just moved to Los Angeles this summer. Um, and I did a trip to Haiti uh, that same summer, uh, working with these Exo computers, the green computer you see right there, um, working uh, to set up some stuff with this new organization called Unleash Kids. Hi, this is Kurt. Hi, I'm Kurt. So I went to Haiti uh, first, I guess I should say. Um, I just work in IT. Uh, I graduated from UCLA almost a year ago. Uh, yeah, I. After that, I decided to get involved in, yeah, went to Haiti this past January, uh, spent just over a week there, visited three, uh, three or four, yeah, four different locations. Um, some of them have internet box, all using the EXO computers right here. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so the little video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and internet in a box, you might know is Braddock's uh, product that he works on, and the, the software these computers runs on is also uh, Fedora, Fedora based. Oh, right. Just to say how it's, how it's Linux. So I think, yeah, uh, some of you might, maybe Braddock was at our presentation at scale, but yeah, a lot of the stuff that we are talking about is tangentially related to Linux and it's not directly, we're not talking exactly about Linux itself, but it, Linux is being used for educational purposes of the exos are based on Fedora and all that. Okay. We have a little video, um, that just gives a, a little picture of what we've done in Haiti in the past few months. Helps. I think it helps to see it. Yeah. It's coming up. Um, what? Oh, there we go. Do we have sound? Yeah, a little bit. This one? us on topic mostly. Those those were all uh, recorded by Kurt's wife on his last trip. 
Okay, um, I'll start. This is, oh. Get it to stop, stop rolling through, okay. This is my friend Meshnikov. Uh, Kurt and I both met him, separate trips to Haiti. Meshnikov is a really bright student. Um, I saw him, the first time I went to Haiti, the school uh, had no computers, and I saw him there. Um, and it's cool because I got to see his, um, his whole uh, journey as he learned how to use computers for the first time, the first time he used computers, and uh, maybe a, week, a few weeks after that too. So it was cool to see this whole school uh, transform when we brought the computers there. Um, I went there originally, I had some free time after school, I took a gap year, uh, and I went just volunteering a little bit. Uh, I came back and I learned a little bit about OLPC. It just um, OLPC is one that taught for child. Project started a few years ago, 2005 or 2006 at MIT, um, and they they're very well known. These computers stick out anywhere. Um, the, their goal originally was one laptop per child in the world. Um, they've gone through a lot of transformations since then. We're a different group using the same computers. Um, and I learned about that. I planned out this this uh, this trip to Haiti. Um, and can we go to the next one? This is the school that I was working at. Um, I kind of just put together this project um, on my own. I found ten donated computers. I found a solar panel, um, and I found uh, I, I talked to the teachers on how we could uh, how we could get these to work in the curriculum. Next slide. You'd actually been there before. Yeah, I did two trips. One, no computers. Second time, found the computers, brought them, brought the solar panel. It sounds like a, it sounds like a tricky thing to coordinate. It is a tricky thing to coordinate, but I had some free time, and it's, it's, it was actually pretty doable. Just to do, just something to do uh, recreationally, you know. Um, this is the school of the computers. After, um, they have ten right now running, which is. It's not very much for a school that has anywhere from 50 to 100 kids, but um, for, a, for a village that has no electricity, um, it's, um, yeah, uh, it's quite an accomplishment. A little bit about the village, yeah. No electricity. Uh, where we're working, where we're working, should, probably should mention this, no electricity, it's remote. Uh, we're actually working on a mountaintop in this school. Um, treacherous, treacherous road to get up there. Uh, I happened to hear about it from a friend who's in the Red Cross. I just thought it'd be fun. Um, what, are, what else? What other problems there? They'd never used computers before. Um, so, yeah, totally uh, very interesting situation for working with computers in education. Cool. Next slide. This is the solar panel that I used. This is a very special solar panel. Um, with uh, thinking how I could get computers to work uh, up in this village. Um, most solar panels are probably about this big, made out of glass, and they're very heavy. Um, to get that uh, to, to get that on a motorcycle up to the top of a mountain would be very difficult. Fortunately, I found this online. It's called the, uh, it's made by a company called Unisolar, which doesn't exist anymore, but they're, they're still floating around. It's a solar panel that's 18 feet long. It's uh, maybe one and a half. Yeah, one and a half feet wide, and uh, it rolls out. I can put it in my camping backpack, and that's how we got it up there. We brought it to the roof of the school, we rolled it out. Um, we have some electronics. Um, had a, next slide. How many watts does that put out? Oh yeah, this puts out 120, and then we, I estimate it as 100, just just because it, it never runs that high. And nothing ever works out <laughs> perfectly. Um, so the system that I put together um, after trial and error and some research is this is the 120 watt panel. Uh, this is a charge controller that I bought for $80. And that's pricey for a charge controller, but I'll explain why, why we had to get this particular one. Uh, this is a 12 volt battery. And then these are the 10 uh, one laptop laptops. These are their XOs, we call them. Um, this solar panel, the rollable solar panel, puts out 24 volts, um, and the battery is a 12 volt battery. Just to simplify things, you could put, I could have put two batteries together, and charged base essentially a 24 volt battery. 
but there's so many ways for that to go wrong, I didn't want to do that. So the safest thing to do is to get this. Uh, it's called a, what do they call it? An MTTP charge controller, uh, which can basically safely and efficiently charge something that's 12 volts with a 24 volt power source. Um, and they have this system locked up at night in a shed and during the day they take it out and they roll it out onto the roof and they charge the battery and then they can charge the computers from there. Um, the, oh yeah, um, this place in particular, um, it would just be unsafe because the teachers, the teachers, you, this, this village is pretty small so you couldn't actually find teachers in the village, they come up from the city. So the people who are in charge of running this are actually um, not even near the village at night. Um, there wouldn't be anyone to take care of it. Um, and just having it up on a roof at night would be a little bit dangerous anyways. So it's not the kind of place to leave electronics lying, lying around. It's like a, a mountaintop, and so this thing rolls out on a roof, or you can just, you can pretty much jump onto that roof from the road nearby. Um, yeah. So it would be just way too easy uh, to, to um, pick it up and run off with it. But I'm, re I'm really happy with this system because it's really portable and it can charge 10 computers. Um, how many, what did I say? Um, the amount, the, the battery is, oh gosh, how many watt hours is it now? <laughs> um, yeah, it's been a while since I did the calculations. I always forget the exact numbers. But essentially, you can charge a third of the battery um, in, you can charge a third of the battery in a day. You never want to let the battery run more than halfway out. Um, because, uh, because that's the, the way these batteries work. If you let them run that, that way, that it'll, uh, it, it can damage the battery over a long period of time. And these, uh, these computers, and by over a day, I mean about six hours, these computers then uh, use about a third of it. So we can actually just use, um, how many watt hours is it? Gosh, it's, um, hmm. <laughs> yeah, it takes, if, if it's if it's about a hundred a uh, hundred watts, and it takes about six hours, you can do the calculation. But it must, usually, be, it must be about nine hundred. Yeah, so yeah, just about nine hundred. That's right. Thanks, Kurt. <laughs> Long day at school. Don't want to do any more math in my head. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, that's a system. Can I answer any questions about the solar system we set up? Um, so we can do up to ten laptops or more. Um, could you do more with this? Um, yes. You think so? I think so. Um, I think so. Um, it's, the, it's kind of hard. Um, we're testing out in a new place, so we wouldn't want to have, have them uh, have to have it out every day for the maximum period of time, the solar panel. Um, but I think you could probably squeeze maybe up to 20, um, and if you put another solar panel on, you could definitely do more. Like I said, the battery could charge all of these computers three times. Um, it's just finding the time to just uh, to have someone go up onto the roof and charge the battery with the solar panel is the main thing. Yeah. Um, is that an automotive battery you have, or is that deep discharge? It's a it's a deep cycle, so it's a bit higher grade than automotive. It cost us two hundred fifty dollars. We bought it at a Home Depot kind of store. Yeah, it's expensive, but um, if you used right, it'll last a long time, and it's a good investment. Um, I tried some cheaper batteries before. Um, it's, it's a good investment and uh, we had to buy it there too because airlines just won't allow bringing big batteries like that <laughs> these days. Yeah. General question, do you have problems getting uh, equipment in past customers? Um, do you have to pay people off? The general answer to that is no uh, because it's just the, um, the enforcement there is just so bad. Other countries, um, it places in Africa there's like corruption and stuff plays a role and you have to pay people off. I never had to pay people off because no one could, would ever take the time to actually look inside my suitcase. Um, it just if I did have to pay someone, I mean I had a 20 in my back pocket, we'll say, but it, that, w that would have been the most that I needed to, to do. Um, we, we go in and we, if anyone asks, we say we're just bringing in used toys and stuff. Also, the rollable solar panel isn't really recognizable as a solar panel when it's rolled up, so I, I'm not worried so much about that. Yeah. Um, we had to do 
Well, Kurt was the one who actually did the training for this. Um, uh, I can talk about it for a second. Yeah, Kurt can talk about that. I'll just say that they're very, um, they're very resourceful uh, people down there. So James set this up, uh, this solar power system up, like the, a year ago or something. And the charge control that he used was too cheap. It overloaded. Uh, he had two of them. They both blew up. So I came down and replaced with this. Uh, I replaced the charge controller with this MTTP or, yeah. or whatever it is. Um, and it has a lot of like idiosyncrasies. So you have to set it for the right battery uh, type. Uh, what is there's three settings. Oh, and then there's a timer, which it's best probably if you just disable because you don't want to get into confusing, yeah, confusing anybody. And then the other thing is there's actually just one button on there. So you have to hold in the button and then something starts flashing and that's, that's how you change the types, right? And then you just wait for a while and that, that sets the setting. The uh, thing to know for this particular system is that every time you touch the button, it cycles on and off the output. So it was really confusing. All of us were really confused measuring no output and then we'd try to change some settings so we'd measure output and then we'd try to change some settings and measure it yeah and it was really really confusing until uh some of us did the rtfm solution and uh read the <laughs> read yeah. the manual <laughs> yeah, I, made sure Kurt did, uh, I made sure that kurt documented this for me he did a really good job thanks we, I, we put it up on unleashkids.org yeah, so you can go, if you want to see the documentation about a lot of these problems and stuff and s solutions, uh, you can go to unleashkids.org. <laughs> and yeah, you can uh, read the blog for the long version, or you can just go straight to the page and I'll tell you how to set this up. Right, and then um, I talked to the guy, uh, the guy who's kind of in charge, or at least in charge of like the computer club. Um, he said he has these batteries at home, he has like inverters and all that stuff, he, and seemed pretty much on top of everything. He definitely knew. Uh, something about electricity and about solar power. So yeah. uh, we gave them like water, distilled water to, to refill the battery because this is the kind that takes water and stuff like that. I think, yeah, we didn't have to do a lot of training in that aspect, but I had to do particular training about this. And that's, that was with the, yeah, that was the only like real training that we had to do. Did you have to speak Creole? Uh, I can speak a tiny bit of Creole, but no, the, uh, the coordinator guy, he speaks pretty good English. His English is yeah. quite good. Yeah. It's possible with English. Their French is pretty good. Yeah, Their I French don't... French is very good, so French helps. I don't speak French. <laughs> yeah. Um, and as far as what their, uh, their strengths are, for their technical strengths, the people down there, they're all used to working with old, beat-up American parts. So all the cars down there are just, they're, mo they're like... Um, you see a lot of like dump trucks and stuff without the shells, like just motors sticking out of stuff. So they're really good at making stuff work. Um, so if I gave them these parts, if I just gave it to them and just said, figure out how to make this work, they would make it work. Um, I'm not really afraid of that. The first time I, I went down there, or the second time I went down, I, the, something came loose and the guy just took a coat hanger, uh, wrapped it around a peso and then um, held that over the stove and used that to solder it back. The thing that's good, that, that we have to teach them is how to maintain this stuff over a long period of time. Because if they just use an any ad hoc solution, uh, the parts will, the battery mostly will be affected, but any, that can, that b first ad hoc solution can be bad over a long period of time. It can waste a lot of money. Mm, that's a good question. Uh, it remains to be, that's definitely something that I want, I'm interested in seeing. I think that the school itself has a lot of organizational issues, so probably, <laughs> probably some part of the uh, program, it's like the computer program itself, will fall apart before the system stops working. <laughs> but um, as far as the the shortest lifespan here, the solar panel is very tough. I think that'll last years and years probably. Um, this is pretty tough. If it's connected to, if there's any kind of surge, if, if there's a kind, it, there's, it's possible that a surge or miswiring could break it, although I think that's unlikely. The battery is probably gonna die first. Um, I don't know how many years, but I think it'll be years before the battery dies completely. If it's taken care of, there's no reason it can't last like maybe five years. Yeah. I think it could, it could easily last five years if they do a really good job taking care of it. And the computers don't seem to break. They've been around since 2006, and I've, <laughs> I've never seen one that's <laughs> entirely broken. Yeah? What would be the difficulty of getting a replacement fuse up to it? 
Um, <laughs> so, yeah, oh. th these are, uh, let's say, ideal. And I think in the actual place, I'm we, pretty sure there's no fuses. Yeah, we actually ran this without fuses because um, there's protection built into the charge controller. Um, I asked, yeah, I'm not quite sure what the point of the fuses are. Is, this, is, this diagram was originally for a home setup. I'm not quite sure what the point of the fuses are, but um, the way it's running right now, it seems pretty safe. Getting parts, getting parts there, you can get most parts if you go downtown in the city. It's, it's about an hour. Uh, up the mountain from Port-au-Prince, so it's actually mm -hmm. not all that far, but it's expensive. Gas is like six dollars a gallon, or it was when I was there. Yeah. Um, so it's actually it's more expensive than here, and of course the sal salary, average salary, yeah. there is quite a bit less. So it's effectively even more expensive. But yeah, uh, the kids hitchhike with the truck drivers that go up there and get sand. And the kids can figure out how to get up and down. There's some of the teachers come in. There's ways to get parts up there. Mm -hmm. if parts are needed. Um, yeah. The hardest thing is mostly communication organization. Okay. Oh yeah, sorry. Does it output 12 volts or 120 or what is it outputting? The solar panel is out. This part is outputting 24. This is outputting 12 to the battery. And then from the what do you charge to the laptops? Um, the laptops are charging off of about 12. Um, yeah, they're, they charge up 12. They, they work from anywhere from like 10 to 18, I think. Um, and I forget exactly how many watt hours it is to charge um, this. But they're, these old ones we're using aren't too much less than, how, than um, a regular laptop. And they last a few hours. Um, just because they're older. The newer XOs are like a quarter of, they, they take like a quarter of the amount of power just because they're more efficient. These computers are like five years old. But for our, but they were free for for my situation, and they turned out to be a really good fit. Did you have the hand cranks? We have the hand cranks. They work as a backup. Um, I don't think they work as a long-term solution so well. I don't think anyone really wants to crank for an hour to use a computer for an it's hour. It's about one minute if you know if you don't know. It's about one minute of cranking for one minute of use. Um, so if you want to use it for an hour, you have to crank for an hour. I've never heard of them being used long-term, yeah. um, but they're cool. I, I don't mind doing it personally. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, yeah, oh, a picture see. of the setup. Um, so this is the MPPT thing. This is the rollout solar panel. Yeah. Which goes, well, uh, uh, we just wired one computer up. Um, James has a thing that can connect all ten at one time, but we yeah. just wanted to see if the output. To oh yeah, just go back one slide. There's We're one actually debugging at this point that that uh, issue with. The, this thing I, I didn't really mention, but this is basically I went to DigiKey and I found the little metal piece that fits into the computer and I soldered 10 of those together. That's the one other piece. That's also on our instructions. And this is roll, this is going the wrong direction. You see it doesn't quite fit. Yeah, they uh, actually put it out like diagonally this way. But. but this is you get an idea of this is a computer, this is a lane. This is a solar panel that broke. Classroom? Yeah, this Are is the, the classrooms there. And the school is called Payday School. And okay. I guess it's me. This is Kurt's part. So my talk's a little bit less technical. It's a little bit more practical, I guess. Um, talking about what I did, well, not only me, me and six other people, roughly, uh, six other Unleashed Kids volunteers and a bunch of uh, local staff to the schools down there did this past January. So. Um, first of all, the, what we try to do is set up, this means club in Haitian Creole, uh, or, or as close as we could get people to approximate the word, um, like as in computer club. We try to set up like a, a space or a club that kids can go to where they can um, learn creatively, uh, learn about technology or learn with technology. Uh, so it's usually like a small, we usually bring like 10 or 20 laptops or something. It's a, it's a smaller place where the kids can work off each other and work with each other and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, so, oh yeah, that'd be great. So this is Mechnikov. I don't know if you remember, James mentioned him at the beginning of his talk. You saw him holding a laptop, uh, an XO. And when I 
when I visited to fix the solar power system, this kid just ran right up to me. He's like, oh, do you know James? And uh, yeah, it was a great guess on his part. And I was like, yeah, I know James. Um, so yeah, we just, after we, get, after we were done fixing the charge controller and all that, I just ran around with this kid. He was clearly excited to see, um, to see us and to have us around. And it was really nice to think that, you know, James prepared, uh, prepared this uh, place where the, the kids, at least he seems happy, happy to see us. So maybe it means that he was happy about what we were doing there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, okay. Um, the place that I went is actually in Port-au-Prince. It's not too far from the airport, probably like um, walking maybe 40 minutes or something by car, maybe 20 minutes from the airport. This is actually the place, this is an orphanage. Um, on the other side, there's a school. There's a concrete wall that separates the two. And uh, this is, Right now, the kids are in school, but this is usually full of, full of little kids. And the place is run by an organization called Hope for Haiti's Children. It's like a Christian organization. Um, I guess I should maybe mention uh, more than 90% of schools in Haiti are uh, private, and probably 99.9% .9 of them are Christian schools. Uh, so yeah, so basically almost every school is, is a private school. And this is, yeah, this is one of those. It's run by people in the US. Um, they have like sponsorship. Uh, so people, c you, you can pay like $30 a month or something that pays for one kid, the room, board, and food, and all that, and, and schooling. The school also serves the neighborhood. Uh, so the neighborhood's not a like rich neighborhood, let's say. It's poor even, it's kind of poor even by Haitian standards. Um, but yeah, so this school is a place, uh, I don't think everybody in the neighborhood can go there, but at least some of the kids from the, from the neighborhood can go. Um, if, you're, if you'd like to support that kind of thing, they sell coffee. Uh, I mistakenly at the scale conference said you had like a, to have a minimum order of 20 or something. There's no minimum order. I, I checked the website, so it's like $10 per pound or something like that. Uh, check out Hope for Haiti's Children and get coffee if you, if you want to support them. Uh, anyway, yeah, go ahead. And yeah, these are some of the kids. They love to pose for photos. So we got a lot of really nice photos with the kids. Um, you know, uh, one of the criticisms of the Haitian school system is that they, they learn a lot by rote. They just memorize. They have to memorize something and then repeat it for the test. Um, so one of the things that we want to do with the computer club is encourage them to be uh, more creative, learn creatively. Um, at the same time, they're going to be learning skills that are going to help them like professionally. So they will ideally maybe go to an interview someday and the, the interviewer will say like, well, can you use, use computers? And they'll say, well, yeah, I was using computers since I was like eight. You know, I'm, I'm totally down with computers. Um, yeah. Sure. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of what we hope to accomplish. And we, to do that, First, we needed, uh, we needed to find out where we needed to go. So there was another volunteer um, who went about a month beforehand. She surveyed a bunch of schools. She talked with a bunch of people. And she found this uh, Hope for Haiti's Children as one of the best candidates. They, were, they seemed really supportive. Um, but then once we decided on that place, there were a bunch of problems that we needed to solve. First of all was the electrical uh, situation. So we faced a, in some ways, similar situation with uh, Ferrier School. Um, but of course, the problems are a little bit different, and I think it's kind of interesting, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into this a little bit. Uh, one of the first things that we had to decide is where to put like the school server, uh, because, right, oh yeah, okay, so sorry, I jumped ahead of myself. So we brought down 20 laptops, we also brought down a school server, um, and... Uh, yeah, electrical infrastructure. So, uh, sorry, yeah, I should talk about the elect. Uh, I should talk about school server first. <laughs> yeah, okay, electrical and school server are like intermixed. Sorry about this. Uh, so, um, we had to decide where we're going to put the uh, school server. This school server takes up a lot of power. Uh, the school is getting free electricity, uh, and the orphanage has to pay for its electricity. It has a diesel generator. It has. Uh, electricity 24 seven, but the school is only on the city grid. So it only has electricity for like two to six hours per day. Um, 
So it's gonna, it was going to be expensive to put our school server, which is basically a content server for the Exos, um, or that's how we're using it. Uh, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But uh, yeah, so we decided to put it, because we wanted it on 24-7, we decided to put it on the orphanage side. Um, and that means that they were going to have to pay for it. And it wasn't like difficult or anything, but it was just a decision that we had to make. Um, we had Wi-Fi infrastructure there already, um, or they did, I should say, but it didn't go across the whole school. It was only it was really centered like on the living quarters for the administration. So this here, what we're doing is we're bringing electricity over. Um, the orphanage would be on the side that's sort of facing us. The school is on the side, sort of over this wall, and we're running a Ethernet cable and a power cable over the wall because we needed a Wi-Fi access point in the school um, because the Wi-Fi wouldn't reach through the concrete walls and all that into the, uh, into the school side from the orphanage side. And then what we did is daisy chained this actually to the other end of the orphanage so that the whole orphanage is covered with Wi-Fi. Uh, there, there was a problem where someone tried to break into a room nearby um, the, the school where that access point is and now they, uh, they basically take down that um, access point. So yeah, this is the school server that we brought. And um, I guess I will tell a little story about setting up this school server. So uh, first, first, yeah, let me go into what school server is for. So uh, it does web caching. I don't, actually, are a lot of, all of you familiar with school server already, pretty much? No, OK. I know Braddock knows something about it, and he did a lot of work getting internet in a box working with school server. So um, I wasn't sure as people who are uh, involved with internet box. So yes, yeah, school server does uh, squid web caching, so if you, which is really useful in places where uh, the bandwidth is capped, for example, or bandwidth is sort of unreliable. So it will cache websites that are frequently visited so that you don't have to load that off the internet. Uh, it does, the other really useful thing in Haiti is it does blacklisting and whitelisting of sites. And I know a lot of uh, Linux and open source people are unhappy to hear uh, of blocking sites and stuff like that, but as private sort of organizations, um, they kind of get to decide uh, how their how their internet is going to be used. And I mean, U.S. schools definitely blacklist sites um, for the most part. What we found in Haiti is they want the whole internet blacklisted, and then we usually just say, well, okay, well let's start with translate.google.com, and uh, you know show that it's useful, and then the the staff will start to see that it's not only for Facebook and looking at Justin Bieber and. Uh, stuff like that. And then um, we try to encourage the teachers to ask for uh, further sites to be whitelisted as, um, as they, they're needed. So I know not too long ago we just opened up some Haitian Creole newspapers for this. Um, and we do that remotely. Uh, it's another one of the great aspects of the school server. It supports or it can be set up to support uh, remote administration. So when a teacher needs something unblocked or if something's not working right, as long as it's not the internet, uh, we can get in there and, and fix it. Is that through SSH? Um, yeah, it's SSH, but it goes through like Amazon. Uh, yeah, open VPN through Amazon or something like that. I actually don't know how it's set up. Uh, yeah, and then there's a couple more things that it's really useful for. One is backing up the student's work so you can register the EXO computers, these EXO computers, to the school server and then back up the student's work. And then, of course, uh, you may all have heard of Internet in a Box. It basically works as an Internet in a Box server or gateway. Um, and this is really useful now in, uh, at this place in Kazo, it's called. Uh, the Internet seems to be going down uh, often and staying down for a while. So when the kids are doing lessons, um, they're going to be able to access Wikipedia and all that stuff uh, from Internet in a Box. And James will get into Internet in a Box a little bit later. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, I think so. So this is the, well, the Wi-Fi access point that I was talking about. This is the cable. So it ran across the wall. It's over there. Um, it ran into the, it's like, it's actually a church building. It serves a dual purpose. They have church there on Sundays and then they have school there during the week. And this is a, it's a village telco system. It's based on TP-Link. Um, this is supposed to be able to sort of do a ad hoc tel telephone network, but we're not using it for that, at least not, not right now. Yeah, I think that's, yeah. Um, 
And this is an example of how the class uh, looks, what the classroom looked like. You might have caught some glimpse of, glimpses of it during the video, but we basically set up a bunch of tables. We tried to get kids to sit in little groups, and we had them do kind of artsy stuff, uh, and then we had like contests after. Um, so that the the best kid or whatever would get some some prize, and we did like um, what's it called, sort of bracketed uh, a bracketed contest. And um, just to give you a little idea about what a course, what the courses are like, um, Sora, the one who went down there beforehand, she actually designed a course guide um, just to help the teachers sort of understand what what it is that they should be teaching, or how they should teach, from a, the assumption that the kids know, haven't touched computers before. So the very first lesson, the kids will get the XO, they'll try to figure out how to open it, and if you uh, haven't done that, that's kind of more difficult than you think, probably. Um, once they get it open, the, a teacher or the teacher will, will go through all the parts of the laptop, like this is a screen, this is a keyboard, this is the touchpad. If they have mice, which they do here, they'll go over the mouse. Uh, and uh, then they'll open it up and, um, yeah, the first, the first lesson consists of that and then going to the record activity, which is basically a camera. So then we get them onto the record activity and send them outside. Uh, they go outside with the laptops and start taking photos um, and come back inside once they've taken some photos, rename the photo and save it. Uh, and it uh, might sound like it'll only take a few minutes, but it actually takes maybe an hour to go over the parts of the laptop, go outside, take the photos, get them back inside. Uh, and so it pretty much takes up one whole class session. Um, then each, each uh, subsequent class tries to build off that. So they've taken a bunch of photos now. The next class, they're going to open up those photos with a program called a Photo Tune, uh, which sounds like Photoshop, but actually Tune is like Cartoon. Uh, and that allows them to put each photo. Um, I think when we were there, they, they set a minimum of three and try to use four. So they would have uh, four photos. And then you can put speech bubbles and write text and stuff like that. Uh, so it gets them, you know, sort of, it gets the kids building off what they've learned before. Uh, also, people can use this, can try it out on this computer, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. We have it all loaded onto these computers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can you can give it a try if you like. Um, I'll be around for a while after, so uh, come by and we can you can play around with the XO, see if you can open it. Um, yeah, uh, so when they're, while they're doing that, not only is it like helping them be creative, and most of them enjoy it. Uh, most of them seem to be having a lot of fun taking photos and stuff like that. But also they're just learning how to type, learning how to manage files and every and stuff like that. Uh, so one of the Later lessons, um, as it, so we try to build and build and build and build until we get to a point where basically uh, one of the later lessons goes like this. They go to translate.google.com, they type in a, a word from in Haitian Creole, translate it to English, co copy that word, paste it into Wikipedia search. It loads up the Wikipedia search page, copy a photo from that page, paste it into, um, I forget the name of the activity, but I think it's called paint, actually. P paste it into paint and then draw on that photo. And that actually involves a lot of um, sort of advanced concepts, uh, but it really gets them in, into using not only the creative aspect, but using computers, a copying and pasting, and you know, getting to content and everything like that. Uh, and so one of the things that really helps, especially like this with the internet, uh, in a place like this where the internet is not so reliable, is internet in a box. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I'll pass it off to oh, James what, to talk about. What oh, age go ahead. Do they learn as writing Creole? So writing, ideally th around the same age as us, but uh, yeah. uh, I mean U.S. U.S. schools. But the big problem, of course, is getting them into school. Um, there are so many private schools; like more than ninety percent are private schools, and then the general population is the average. You know, salary is really, really low. Uh, probably less than a thousand dollars a year or something. The school is really expensive, and as because of that, maybe maybe sixty percent go to school. Um, it's improving, so maybe seventy percent today, but it's really hard to say. Um, only so a few third years ago. writing in pre or second grade, so you know before that they're really not being able to type into the computer. 
Yeah, this is yeah. a problem that was faced in a, uh, more in another, even more remote place than James went to, um, where uh, Sora, that other volunteer, had gone to set up a club in like a super, super remote place, and she just found that basically nobody could write. So uh, she had to start from a whole different place. Um, she had to start from text recognition um, outside of computers. Um, but I guess there were a few people there who, who could use computers, and hopefully they will be helping the um, the people who can't read and write to uh, yeah to be able to use them. Yeah. So basically, that is the the ultimate goal is to have the whole thing take on a life of its own. So uh, I've joked before that it it's like a good system administrator should automate himself out of a job or herself. Uh, so automate everything and step away is, the, is, is ideally how it works. Of course, it never works that way in real life, whether it's system administration or setting up schools. Uh, so yeah, we try. Um, Sora went down, trained the teachers to train the kids. And there's at least one example of um, a kid who went to the, the orphanage that I'm talking about. Um, he saw us milling around up there and came up and uh, became interested in the program. And then he um, is sort of taken on a TA role. Uh, so he is helping out the younger kids um, yeah, with, with their learning. Uh, so there's at least some hint that it's possible. Uh, well, it remains to be seen if, that, if it's going to take off like that. If, if it does, that's, uh, yeah, that's exactly how we want it to go. Yeah, we rely mostly on the teachers there to do the teaching. Yeah, in this case, they're actually being paid by Hope for Hades Children. Um, they, they actually are collecting uh, salary. Um, in some other cases, they might not be. Uh, yeah. Cool. All right. So, yeah. Oh, go ahead. What's your typical class size? I count, what, 15 to 20 in the picture? Yeah, let's see. I think it was 20 or 25 in this class. Um, class size that small. Right. Uh, well, all you have to do is privatize all the U.S. education. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, yeah, uh, some places are even smaller. That one in the super remote place, that's an even smaller class of 10. I think she has three classes a week of 10 or something like that. Um, at another place that we visited, it was about 40 students, and it was two or three kids to one laptop, which is a, not, not quite the one laptop per child. but. Uh, yeah, it's typical is hard to say because it varies so much from place to place. Yeah. OK, so James can talk a little bit about Internet in a Box and how we're using it down there. OK, I believe this is called a Seagate drive, right? That's what we call it. Uh, how many people, uh, does there, do people here know Braddock? Yeah? OK, good guy. Yeah, uh, did, do we, uh, did he tell you about Internet in a Box before? Yeah. Okay. I'll just su I'll just sum it up again. Um, Internet in a box is this product that or is this project that Braddock's been working on. Um, really useful in the developing world where we don't have internet. Um, that's the whole idea: is to take all these great internet resources and then put them uh, so you can take the internet with you. We have something like 37 languages of Wik of Wikipedia um, with images and full text and searchable. Um, there's OpenStreetMap um, to all levels, which is great, um, good for geography. Um, and there's Khan Academy videos, right now in English, hoping to get some in some other languages, hoping to get some in French. And there's um, a whole bunch of ebooks from Gutenberg, most English, but some French too. And there's, um, there's, there's some open source software and a few other things. So all this. A terabyte, um, one drive, you can put it on a wireless hard drive, you can plug it into the school server. Um, it's a great useful tool for us because we're going to places where uh, internet isn't so good. Um, some places have no internet. Um, all places in Haiti um, have, if they do have internet, it's coming from someone's cell phone, pretty much, or a SIM card that's been plugged into a computer. So um, while that actually can get pretty fast these days, it's usually not very fast. So we need to find a better way. Um, and so this has been great for us. Uh, we have it in, what, three schools, maybe three schools near Port? Maine, 
We do, personally? Yeah. Oh, yeah? Six. Six now, okay. So, six schools using this um, in Haiti at the Unleash Kids, with Unleash Kids projects. Um, kids can do all sorts of different projects using these resources. They can do, like Kurt was saying, they can do research on Wikipedia. They can go through the images. Uh, they can watch Khan Academy videos on their own. Uh, that'll be much easier once those are in French for us. Um, overall, it's a really useful device. We've also been talking to a few other people um, who, uh, who have even larger networks of computer programs in Haiti who want to use stuff like this. Um, can they understand French, French or is it going to be real? Um, they can understand French after the age of like, it's like third and fourth grade that they start requiring them to use French in school. But the teachers speak French after that age, so they can, they can learn in French. So that's, that's good. Um, Wikipedia has Haitian Creole too. I don't know if that's on there, but Wikipedia, um, Wikipedia has French, Haitian Creole, it has everything. Um, this goes well with the course guide, which our friend put together. Um, we can reference back and forth between this and the content available. There's a lot of room for uh, improvement here, and there's a lot more ideas we can come up with to help the teachers for ways to use this. But so far, it's been, it's been a big success, so we thank Braddock for working so hard on that. Hmm, what was this slide supposed to be about? <laughs> um, I think this is the wrap-up part, isn't it? Probably. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think you guys understand it in a box pretty well, and um, Braddock does a really good job of explaining it himself. Um, but I think it just suits, suits it to say that it's been a really good complement to the, the stuff that we do already. One of, the, yeah. one of the reasons we wanted the school server to be in the orphanage and be on 24-7 was because it serves internet in a box. And uh, though we didn't really mention it to the administration, basically anybody walking by with a cell phone can join the Wi-Fi network. It's open. Uh, well, there are two Wi-Fi networks, and one sort of only for teachers and administration. The other one is open for the students to, to easily join so they don't have to worry about typing passwords and stuff like that. Anybody walking by would actually have access to Internet Box. So they would actually have access to um, Wikipedia and Khan Academy and all that, or the people who live nearby, stuff like that. If they just happen to look at their cell phones, oh, what's this? A club, you know? And then, and we kind of secretly wanted that to happen. Um, so it's sad to me that they're, they're taking down the uh, Wi-Fi access point that's closest to the street um, after, after school hours. Uh, maybe we can get that situation fixed next time we visit if we can put a cage around it or something like that. But yeah, that's one of the really nice things about internet in a box is you can use it to share uh, your internet connection, well, not really that internet connection, but a, a kind of internet connection with a whole community without really worrying about um, if they're going to use it for illegal things or anything like that. Like, it's, it's one way, and it's really helpful for that kind of situation. So, um, yeah, that's one of the use cases, in a way, is to secretly give a whole neighborhood <laughs> access to... Uh, Wikipedia is probably the the uh, most like salient, useful thing, that if people Definitely. yeah. It makes such a big difference having no internet. I mean, you have having no internet, you have having internet, and then you have having just Wikipedia. It's, it's such a big difference. Yeah. Compared um, to having no internet. Even in the United States, a good portion of the uh, the school system is not internet open because of. Uh, the principals and the administrators be concerned that students would look at funny cat videos. So even actually the internet in the box could be used, uh, you know, to support all of the various different uh, educational um, programs without being concerned about funny cat videos or, you know, yeah. see my friend get, you know, hurt on a, you know, on a skateboard or whatever, you know. Right? Are there any cat videos? There are no cat videos. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but that's why you yeah, include the cat videos so that it, you know, that, that'll make it happen and then in the box really take off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the highlights of the internet cat videos. Okay, right on. YouTube tried to develop an educational content video uh, section so that, you know, the, the administrators can go to, but it's still kind of regular yeah. educational systems are not porting to that. Yeah. So, For know, well, that could be useful. the box could be used here yeah. in the United States, not just in a poor country. Yeah, uh, I tend to agree with that. It's not our focus exactly. Um, yeah, but I, I think there are probably uses. There are probably a lot of uses for it all, all over the world. Uh, it, 
Um, it is probably most useful. So there's a place. Um, Oh, I kind of remember what this slide is about. <laughs> we work with a lot of different organizations. We're, so uh, there's one organization that we've worked with uh, at least a little bit who's brought, um, it's this guy, Denny and his organization have brought 700 um, Linux Mint laptops that have been donated from corporate entities or whatever um, and all around Haiti. And one of the places that he has some number of laptops is like in some valley in the middle of absolutely nowhere that you can only get to by helicopter or horseback. Uh, and there's some, I guess there's some kind of pol um, solar power there because otherwise the laptops would be useless. Uh, and I, I know there's been attempts. I don't know if Braddock has heard back if something has made it there, but they're attempting to get internet in a box there at the very least. And that, I mean, that is going to be probably more helpful for them who can't just go to a library or something like that. Yeah. But I do think that there are, there are uses, a lot of different uses for it. Um, the most effective might be in those sort of really remote uh, with Unleashed Kids, we're worried about making sure that these get used. Um, so we're usually going to places where they have some kind of electrical infrastructure, where they might be able to connect to the internet someday, at least. Um, so arguably, it's not the most effective place to put internet box, but I think it is useful, useful for them. Yeah. So what we were doing with this slide was uh, recruiting people. If you have a talent. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I just thought first we could. Um, Go ahead. This. Basically, what we've said so far gives you an idea of what we've done in the past year. Um, to tell you where we are right now, um, as Kurt was kind of leading into, there's a lot of stuff we're working on, um, and we're working on, uh, for one thing, we're working on getting, keeping these current deployments going, but that involves a bunch of different projects. We, um, there's maybe like five of us that are working hard on this. Um, and, spread over a lot of different projects, um, working with school server, working with internet in a box, um, working with this course guide here, um, and working with uh, the software on the computers, um, the XOs themselves, uh, solar power. So those are all the areas that we, we kind of need to cover in order to make sure this stuff is working. Um, one, I'm, yeah? I'm really interested in content. So uh, we got at least one teacher, mm -hmm. uh, right? <laughs> yeah, and you too, yeah. right? Yeah, okay, good. I thought I recognized you. So uh, I want to talk, oh, cool. Yeah, I want to talk to teachers about what, uh, look, like especially looking over the course guide and see if there's mm -hmm. improvements that can be made or if there's other things that we can do. One cool thing about the school server I didn't really go into is you can add the content. You can, it's really easy to make a web page. So if there's some web-based learning tools, it's really easy to put it into the school server. Yeah, we use FSI, Foreign Service Institute, and uh, the DLI for language acquisition. So we have a full-on like, four years of French. Okay. There's, there's an audio file which wouldn't take up much room. Mm. You know, and then on the server it has both PDF and also um, uh, you know text along with the audio files, so that they can actually learn you know basic. French all the way up, you know, for third and fourth graders writing yeah. and speaking in French. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds interesting, yeah. Yeah. And uh, then I have other languages as well, but you're French for you. Right. Yeah. But in Africa, I have about 16 languages in Africa. Michael runs an online course group that is yeah. called uh, World Mentoring Academy. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so he has a lot of yeah. ideas like that, and, and what you're mentioning, stuff that some of this you were mentioning before, ideas like that are the kind of stuff that really helps us. Um, we, we like to hear, there's so much stuff like this that's being done that uh, just the, not all the ideas get passed around all the time. So it really helps us to hear stuff like that. And obviously, um, branching into software, branching into education, branching hardware and electricity and all that stuff, um, we're spread pretty thin for knowledge, but we do what we can. So people who are specialists, um, it's really great for us to know people like that and people who are interested in this kind of stuff. So, yeah, we really like to talk to you about um, all that stuff. Kurt, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, if you don't mind, come let me, yeah, come find me. <laughs> and well, I think the next slide is the good slide. Yeah, and the cool thing about just kind of this kind of work is you combine all that stuff with the adventure and the excitement of feeling like Indiana Jones. Um, Running, so, running into the wilderness and, uh, and w with all this technology, it just uh, it, it makes a great uh, adventure. For, that's, that's one of the reasons why I do it. 
I think yesterday there was like a story on Slashdot that said, would you, somebody was saying, would you recommend uh, making a new one laptop per child deployment with X01s um, these days, considering the laptops are too old and the whole the corporate situation is iffy at best. Uh, yeah. Um, we just did that. Like we, we just did a bunch of uh, new deployments. And yeah, it seems to be one, an idea that comes up a yeah. lot. Um, all we all we need all you need to be is crazy enough to bring ten computers down there and find some village or maybe not ten five whatever find some village and set it up and just get it going and work with people like and uh, we've had some success and uh, I think a lot of people have an idea that one laptop per child never made it because there's millions of kids without laptops or something like that but. Uh, a lot of us sort of think that their approach might not have been the best way, so it's why we're working directly with schools and stuff like that. Work directly with the schools, directly with the staff. Make sure that the laptops are actually getting used. They go right to a school instead of to a department of education in a closet or something like that. Uh, and then, you know, we also go there and set it up where the original idea was to just helicopter drop them all over the world and the kids would figure it out themselves. Uh, yeah, so you know, if you're crazy like James or me and you want to go to Haiti or Nepal or I don't know any other candidate. Uh, yeah, talk to us. Or we if you're we might be able to. You just like the, the, <laughs> the easier part of it, or the, the yeah. more. Or you have family uh, somewhere. The more technical part of it. Um, or if you're interested in it, um, we our website is unleashkids.org. There's a lot of uh, stories and technical details as well on there. Um, you can talk to us or just email us from the website. Yeah, we have uses probably for developers, for admin, system admin kind of people, um, and crazy adventure seeking uh, right. yeah. technical generalists. Or, or if you're all in one, which is, <laughs> yeah. which is a lot of us too. Right. Uh, yeah, and I think unless, yeah, I think that's about it. So if there are more questions, go ahead. Especially and, if you have suggestions for it. Yeah, us. suggestions totally. is also something we're, we're yeah. really interested So like that, uh, which I'd like to talk about later. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned that one of the things that you were excited about was letting other people in the city connect to your Wi-Fi. Yeah. Did you ever look at the logs and see whether or not like non-school like MAC hmm. addresses had connected Um No, I haven't done that. I, I think it's possible. I mean, you could um, just look at the user agent and see if they're using an Excel, see, oh, see right. if they're using yeah. this operating system. Um, well, the that teachers would give you a rough idea. Teachers might be using cell yeah, phones. Yeah. True. Yeah. Oh yeah. You could look for cell phones even. Um, yeah, that's an interesting. That would be an interesting test. No, we haven't done it. It would be interesting to see those could, results, though. That, that would be great to see that grow. To see more. Yeah, there there are a few projects to get uh, internet out there in places where it's hard to get, but it'd be great to have something like that growing. Cool. Well, thanks. For, oh yeah. Yeah, please. Oh, does the leash kid who paid for your tickets get down there? I mean, how does that? Um, we paid for them. Um, w there might be some. It's possible that Unleashed Kids might have some money in the future. Possibly. Um, maybe not. Um, <laughs> we just, just kind of. We, we do what we can with the money that comes in. Um, but we, a pay, lot of, we pay for our tickets individually mostly. Yeah, a lot of what we did is. Huh? No, a lot of what we did is self funded. So um, we paid our own tickets. Uh, James paid for the battery and the rest of the solar power system at Feye. Um The school that I worked with paid for most of the infrastructure stuff, um, including Wi-Fi access points and the server uh, itself, but uh, we didn't get any sort of salary or anything like that. Yeah, but um, my position is that um, if you're creative, it's really not, it's not too hard to raise the money to, to, to fundraise and to get money for stuff like this because it's actually not too expensive. I mean, um, a few hundred dollars for a plane ticket and that solar system, I, I say I raised some money for the solar system, but that's a $500 solar system, so it's not too expensive. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it makes it a difference. Probably more like 650 or so for the solar power, mm -hmm. but. So like is Unleashed Kids, like are they working all over the world or is it Haiti or what's the organization? We, we're small, we started like a year or so ago. Right now it's Haiti and Nepal. Did you guys start it? Or? We, know, like, we know the people who started it. Who started it exactly? It's hard to say. I, don't, I would suspect it's, it's uh, Adam and Sora, neither of whom are here today. Um, <laughs> They're both on the East Coast. Yeah, just a few people started it. We know them. Yeah. Um, uh, 
as far as funding, I think like there's some. So I'm not too involved with, on the money side, but there's they're like mid 501c3 application, and I guess it's I don't know I don't I don't know where it's really going on with that, but I guess there's some. We do sell these t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> it's not gonna buy a ticket to Haiti, but. But yeah, I mean, my trip, my wife and I went. The whole trip probably didn't cost two thousand dollars. I mean, um, yeah. probably quite a bit less than that, maybe fifteen hundred. It's, it's doable if it's the kind of thing you want to do, sort of a vacation or something like that. Do they still sell the XL1 types, or where did you get those from? Yes and no. You can buy XL1s on eBay for about 100 bucks. Uh, a lot of people, um, if you remember the buy one get one program, a lot of people got a laptop and then never used it. Uh, and um, the creators of Unleash Kids or whatever, the people who started Unleash Kids, basically got people to re-donate their get one if they weren't using it. Um, and a lot of XL1s came in that way. So there, we have access to them, but I don't think XL1s are being made anymore. Uh, XO4s, it looks like orders. There are tablets. Yeah. Uh, the tablets. The tablets aren't so well suited for what we do. Yeah. To say the least. Yeah. Um, the tablet. A lot of a lot of the OLPC community doesn't like the tablets and isn't using the tablets. Um, well, they're meant, the tablets are first world. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Uh, the XO4 laptops, the new versions of this one, um, it looks like some orders are being filled. So. Uh, but it's unclear uh, if they're going to be available in the long term. And the XO4 is also, you could say it's a tablet because it has a touch screen right. and you hold yeah. it like this. Right. Um, so we have access to a bunch of these. They last forever. I mean, this, this is probably six years old. So uh, we might as well put them to use, you know? <laughs> yeah. As far as we're not... As Unleashed Kids, we kind of don't care what platform we use. If, if it ends up turning into Raspberry Pi or Arduino or a tablet, Android, Android tablet or something like that, that's fine. As long as the content is there and we can get, and we can we'll, use it for education. If we, and, if we last for a few years, that'll probably, we'll probably end up going to Android or something like that because they're not making too many of these. But um, yeah. Yeah, but we have a bunch, so. Well, I, we're I pretty know. much combiners of technologies, <laughs> not attached to any one technology in particular. OK. Thank Thanks you. Everyone.